hi. Hi, Allison. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, I am here today with Annie and John, um, Annie Helmark Slaughter and John Lauder, and they are artists who live in the area. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you guys about your work. Um, my name is Allison Bowman. <laughs> I'm the administrative assistant for the Arts Council of Johnson County, and this is our creative conversation series. Um, so let's just jump right in. And first thing I like to ask people is to tell us about yourself and your background. Um, so John, do you want to start? Tell us about yourself, um, kind of your- Sure. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Idaho. I was an outside kid. Um, got interested in art in the first grade by actually telling a lie. So I lied my way into the art world. I, I discovered that if you used um, my mom's typing carbon paper, that I could transfer images from the outdoor life onto my scrap pieces of wood that were around. And then I could get out my wood burner and I could burn the outline of that moose onto that board. And I took one into school and the teacher said, oh my, these are really good. Did you do it freehand? And in my head, when I ran that wood burner around there, that was freehand, there was no, <laughs> You know, yep. that was, so, oh, and then, so I became the designated artist from that point on. I had to make all the posters and everything, but I was also interested in it. So then I basically ran through an academic um, support of art. I did have a, a wonderful aunt, Aunt Ella, wonderful, wonderful weekend artist who uh, supported me before I was, you know, really uh, involved in the school academic level and supplied me with books on how to make art and for my first watercolor set. So high school, I took all the art classes. Um, college, Whitman College was my first experience. I went right out of high school and did four years of, of training there and got a BFA, or no, a BA in, in um, studio art there. It was a fairly limited experience. There was a um, it was a good experience. I, I have lifetime friends from that experience. Then I went back home and did sheet metal work for 10 years and learned how to, to make big sculpture and grow up a little bit and get married and divorced and, you know, do all those things that you do when you're 20 to 30 or something like that. <laughs> and at my grandmother's funeral, the uh, minister mentioned the fact that she was talented as a musician and she played the piano every day and played every weekend and she didn't waste her talent. And that hit me. I was doing sheet metal work. It was good sheet metal work, but so I went back to grad school and did a post back at the University of Oregon to get back in the swing of things to go to graduate school. So two more years, uh, 60 more credit hours of just art. I didn't have to do any of the other things that applied for um, graduate schools and went and was accepted at University of Arizona and uh, did my graduate um, studies there and started teaching there at Pima Community College and in the foundation program at the university and finally was hired after nine years of teaching and ended up teaching here at uh, UCMO in Warrensburg for 20 plus years so okay. academic all the way through very cool so now I'm retired and from teaching but so Annie and I have decided we're full-time artists mm -hmm. I am yeah you are <laughs> Very cool. So that's me. I've done mine. Done that's my cool. art world. That's your Annie. Opinion. Do you want to go? Well, mine's really quite different. Um, okay. <laughs> I grew up uh, with a single mom and a sister. Um, my mother, believe it or not, was an Alaskan explorer, and she was a writer and a very well-known writer, actually. But like artists, didn't make a lot of money, so we lived pretty modestly. But she did take us all over the world with her to places that most people don't ever get to do. And almost all of that was based on nature, going out into nature in very remote areas. <laughs> my sister, my older sister could draw anything. <clears throat> She's one of those people that, you know, she sat down in dragons and horses and whatnot. And I could not do that. It's like, I had lots and lots of ideas, but I couldn't do that. Now, I never took any classes in art in school, even in grade school. I don't know why it never occurred to me that one could. And then also, even though I was constantly making things, I'd tell my sister what I wanted and she'd draw it. But I was making a lot of things now that I look back on, it looked a lot like earth art, like Andy Goldsworthy. 
and also working with strings and weaving. And, but, but there was nobody that I was looking at in, in the physical life. I didn't, didn't know any artists. I just knew that I was a compulsive maker, but I didn't think I was an artist because you know artists are supposed to draw. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, let's move past several things, including um, a first career and then motherhood and then a divorce. And I couldn't not make things, especially well, I was a little bit older than you and I realized that it wasn't just a hobby. It never really had been, but it, like it dawned on me. And I had a, I was making watercolors at that time. And uh, I had a, a number of people say that my work looked like Bruce McGrew. I said, who's that? And I found out he was a professor at the University of Arizona. I was living in Tucson. So I went, finally came up enough, I had to see who this person was. Because I mean, it just came up all the time. And uh, so I went to the University of Arizona and I went into the art department and it was like, Wow, you know, it's like my tribe. I found, I did, I found my tribe, and here I am. Here I am, a single mother trying to keep the you know the body and soul together. But I could not not go. I could again. It was something that I just couldn't do by only learning on my own. And that was, uh, you know, it was like that was that was the, the change for me. It's funny, I ended up being a, um, a drawing professor for many, many, many semesters before I became a painting professor. It was like, you know, it's like, I realized this is a skill one can learn, uh, but is that all that stuff has, it's interesting for me as a mature artist that it becomes less important, not more. And uh, sometimes I feel like unlearned what I learned when I was teaching it because you know, there's a lot of things about accurate perceptual skills that as an artist doesn't interest me. Mm -hmm. So it was a long, um, circuitous route. So my first art class, I was about 35. <laughs> it was like, wow, but I, I, never, I never turned back. And the truth is I, I had been doing it all my life. I just hadn't claimed it. You know, I, I hear so many people that say, oh, but I can't, I wish I could do that, but I can't draw. You know, you just want to, you just want to take them by the shoulders and <laughs> sit down and say, just ignore that, please. Were you a student in one of my classes for a day? For one day. <laughs> one day before you guys really knew each other and. Oh, we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other at, at all. all. You were the teacher and she was. He a was a, he was a uh, graduate student who oh, okay. had just graduated. I was a, yeah, a graduate teaching weren't, weren't assistant. Weren't you teaching for Cole Scott for that? No, that class? was a summer class that they'd given me to teach painting. Anyway, I went in and got all my supplies and I remember thinking, oh my God, this is, this is, I'd never taken a painting class I, and uh, summer school class. And um, it was so delicious watching him squeeze out a big tube of yellow paint. I will never forget it. I was like, oh, Lori, that's just <sighs> That's amazing. Well, I go home after the first day and I have a call from my sister who is, lives in Alaska. Most of my family lives in Alaska. They still do wild, crazy things. And uh, she said, well, if I send you a ticket. Will you come up and run a river with me for six weeks? And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> I pulled together childcare and figured this out and yes, I'll come. And so I, I did do that. I came back the next day and I said, I'm really sorry that I, I can't take your class because I'm going to go to Alaska. And he was silent for a moment and said, is there room for two <laughs> or something to that effect? You know, it's like, oh, that sounds like a better summer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's how that went down. Although we didn't get together as a couple for probably a year and a half after after that, right. I, I kind of forgot who he was and things. Yeah, went. yeah, it happens. <laughs> you forgot who I was? Oh man, I didn't know that. No, <laughs> I never forgot. I never forgot. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so I want to pull up some of your guys' work and so we can look at it and we can talk about it. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and I am going to not show that. Sorry. <laughs> You're doing this much better than I do. <laughs> All right, there we go. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. I'm gonna start with John. Um, okay, so we are on John's website, which is johnlauder.com. Straightforward, very simple to remember. Um, and 
John, where do you want to start? What do you want to talk about first? Um, I guess we can just look at maybe scroll down some of these recent paintings. They're called recent paintings, although they're not so recent because I'm not very good at keeping up my, my artwork. <laughs> but anyway, the, but that's that's let's stop right on. Let's stop on this one. And that's a, actually a public works piece for um, the cancer center at the uh, what was it? Indian Creek, um, Kansas. Medical, Medical Center. Center, Indian Creek Campus. They had some public money and Sherry Lady connected me up with this painting and they wanted a painting about that creek where, which is the namesake of their, their campus, which is close to here. So Annie and I went over and we spent a couple of times painting on location and finally came up with this spring painting. And it's one of my, um, I call them satellite landscapes or or whatever, I guess satellite's easiest. But this idea of, of the contemporary artist, contemporary landscape viewer, we look at you know, the images of our landscapes on our, on our laptops, on our phones, on, on all of these devices, but we can also pop right on those devices and we can go to Google Earth and we can look at that landscape yeah, anywhere in the world. In we car. can just zoom in and I'm a map nut. I go on Google Earth almost every night. I was yeah, looking at- You always have been. Looking at, I was looking at, terrible mines in the Philippines last night. But anyway, they're, they're so beautiful, but God, red lakes, that's just gross. Anyway, back, <laughs> back to this. So I started this series of landscapes, traditional, but then countering it with what it looks like from above to give the viewers some sort of sense of that we're looking into this image and it has a different kind of uh, feeling and it can be very beautiful from above or it can be not so interesting. Interesting part of this one is they I, I wanted they wanted it to be I think more like this because there's actually a car lot right on the left side and then there's a restaurant on the right and side there's a freeway and then there's a freeway that. right over there on the, on the other I mean it's right in the middle of of the state line of Kansas City yeah. <laughs> in Kansas so anyway that that was what that was all about. But tailored to the client's needs, right. very, very specific size, everything precisely. Yeah, yeah, I, I see down here it's pretty big, eighty four. Most the public works, generally speaking, are fairly good size for the two dimensional work. I mean, there are that's I shouldn't say that that's they do that's one of the places where you can actually put large art. It's harder to place mm -hmm. larger art than it is smaller art. Obviously, in a gallery, mm -hmm. they more clients want to carry it out than have it delivered. Yep. Let alone having a wall space for it. Yeah. So the first, you know, the, so the rest of the ones on this page are basically it's another example of the satellite image. And this is Great Dunes National or National Park in Colorado. Annie and I went and camped there. And this one I added additional parts that we can talk about. Let's go back to the sand dune ones. In the art world, we have this idea of the landscape or the view this ellipse of, of, of sight and or sight lines, the, the edges of where a rectangle that we, so the blue and brown line on the edge is kind of the edge of the view of the landscape and the um, lines down below correspond. So you can see that cone of vision that we have. So it's just another way to connect the two different pieces. Okay, oh yeah, okay, I get it, very cool. What I want to add to these is uh, John and I, we're very much perceptual artists in that we, we, we want to be sincerely in contact with the places we make work about. So um, we, we spend quite a bit of time at this place. Well, not quite a bit of time, but about four days, but enough to do quite a lot of little paintings. I guess I think about the time we spend not so much in how many weeks, but whether or not you're out there really working on the land. And um, John, uh, in particular, did a, uh, spent time climbing the sand. And if you've never been to this uh, national park, it's a stunning place. Yeah. Uh, so to, those little pieces are done on site, and they may or may not be used in the final, usually not in the final, uh, the piece, but they are for gathering information. And we both feel that that's essential for us to have authenticity and not just be visual tourists that we really need to be there and make work on that place. And that brings some sincerity or authenticity into the piece, does that, if, if you understand that. Yeah, 
Yeah. So as you look at these on John's page, that they've all we've all we've been there to all those places. Okay. Very cool. Um, do we want to scroll down? Sure. This one's a, another approach where the uh, actual the satellite image was as interesting as the place I thought. And this is a place called Pillar Falls. It's a, a it's a place down in the Snake River Canyon where I grew up as a kid. And when I was a kid, we couldn't get down there. But since then, they've opened up a public um, boat ramp below this area. And we, Annie and I kayaked up and hiked all over those rocks one summer. When the river's not running, you can go right up into it. This is just directly below or down river, about half a mile from where Evil Knievel tried to jump the Great Snake River Canyon. Oh. So this is, this is where I grew up. So this one is the satellite image in the center. But then images all the way around that are from How down there. Piece? on. It's them. a big piece. <clears throat> yeah, each one of the small squares is 12 inches square. So it's six oh. feet by six feet. It is a heavy son of a gun. I'll, it's beautiful to look about to move. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Is it yeah, on? Who, who oh, it's on that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God. That, so are all of you... It's all one piece. It's not like little stuff. Yeah, I fastened it all together and framed okay. it. So it's, it's, it's a monster. It's, you can't it's take it apart. Monster. But yeah, it weighs a lot, but yeah. a lot of it does. That's crazy. Huge. Yeah, I know it was crazy. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that I'll have an idea and I'll go, well, you know, I, I'd like to make this thing, but I don't know where it's going to go. And I have no idea how we're going to hang it and where, how we're going to move it or store it, whatever. And John will always say, make make what you want to make and then we'll figure it out afterwards now yeah. that's worked all of our lives together it's a, a little bit of a problem right now so we have a really full storage space for art mm -hmm. but i still wouldn't take that back you know i, I feel yeah. sorry for our kids they're gonna to have to deal with it someday we're Some doing, of it. We're doing uh, what we can to, to move <laughs> it so they don't have to because a lot of john's big paintings and mine too in particular my textiles are they're really you know you can't see this being in somebody's living room you know right. <laughs> you, well you can but it's going to have to be a really big living room right certainly. but again i i i, I kind of go off of off my message here that to make what you want to make yeah. that's what keeps the juices flowing yeah yeah you I know like that. that that's you good advice that too. yeah you're an artist too you know this one yeah, and I often get myself into trouble because I make what I want to make, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know, I think um, that's when, that's when what you, we do you, as artists. Yeah, that's what we do as artists, and, and I think if you if you shut that down, it just becomes another job. You've just turned what you love into a job. Yep. And I don't mean that you don't ever make a commission for a client or tailor an idea because they have a purple sofa. I think none of us are above that. However. If that's all you do, you lose your heart. And after a while, you lose that love to make things. So I, th I think if you want to be a lifetime artist, that this isn't just, um, you know, it's not a superficial thing. It's, it's the real deal. You really, you've got to go for that passion that puts you in that space to want to be an artist in the first place. Yeah. You have to nurture it. It's great advice. And I agree. <laughs> This one's actually the opposite. I, I was looking for a fishing place down at Montrose Reservoir Access and saw the Google Earth image of the coal-fired plant down there. So it was, it was just interesting abstracted shapes and forms, a little bit different kind of a uh, subject matter than I'd worked with. So I did the, the factory first, and then we went down and I did the location studies and that thing roars like a big, big dragon it's, it's not a fun place to be yeah. so this painting is kind of like oh yeah that's that's a big coal-fired plant all right <laughs> yeah that, that's huge <laughs> that's cool the the smokestacks like go into the i try to connect the two pieces in you know one way or another yeah you know either conceptually or with sight lines or those, Certain, by the way, are two certainly separate by color. Yeah, I always separate the two panels. They are framed together as one, but they're made. So they're diptychs in a sense. Okay. Or cool. two piece paintings. And again, all most of these have been fairly large. Mm -hmm. Six foot category. 
Yep. That one's seven, 72 square too. Wow. Oh, yeah. This one was exactly the opposite. It was a beautiful place down on the bubble, Buffalo River in Arkansas where we'd canoed by and kayaked by and we spent many hours floating down there. So the, the view of the reflections in the water created the idea and then the landscape or the satellite image was interesting too. We both um, did separately a month long um, artisan residencies down there. Now they shut that down for a while, but I kind of think it might be open again. I'd really recommend that um, people think about going down there for a month. The, yeah. I, don't know the, I don't know the conditions anymore. They don't put you up where they put us up, but it, I think that it is opened up again and it's not that far away for people in the Kansas area. You know, that transportation gets to be an issue of carrying all your stuff. Right. But a month really gives you a, a long time to, to let it in. Now, anybody that wants to paint on, on location, the artist residency in the national parks is a, is a great way to, to have an experience that's supported by the, the federal government. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool thing. Look it up, apply, go. Cool. That's uh, Hawaii. We went to for our son's uh, wedding. Oh, cool. We, we managed to stay for a month. We found a BNB and b we could afford for a month. So Annie and I made art every day. And then I came back and did this big, big uh, image of Kauai. This is the Nepali coast. It's the northern coast. It's so dramatic. Seeing it in Hollywood images mm -hmm. and just amazing volcanic wall of yeah. rocks. And, and the turquoise versus the red, you know, it's just a spectacular place, crazy. Scroll down to some of the big fish. You have that on that page, don't you? Because no, they're, they're not on that fish. No, they're not. And that's um, Exit Glacier in uh, Alaska. We went and spent a month at Annie's sister's house, house set for it. That was the, that's the egg. They call it the Exit Glacier. It was a glacier that explorers could actually hike down to get off the top of the. Big tongues of ice. There was a big ice sheet, big sheet thing. up above this. I can't remember the name of it, but it's across on the Kenai Peninsula area. So it was one of the early ones that where I got excited about this idea of this Shrinking. landscape versus Shrinking. this geology or geo, you know, satellite image. I love how you have that ridge run right into the panel below. And look at that. That's they beautiful. often connect that way. Beautiful it's design. Funny way that works. Yeah, gorgeous. I think Exit Glacier is the glacier that President Obama visited. Yeah, I don't I know what he yeah, was up to. Yeah, because it's accessible. Oh. Although okay. they're shrinking. Oh my goodness, they're shrinking. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. Our work is, um, both of us, is is sometimes very overtly, but almost often subtly um, about conservation. We've, we're, 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 we're seniors. We've lived long enough to see these places change in our lifetime you know you think about environmental change and, and you think about it being somebody else's problem i i don't mean to be blunt but that's the truth but it's a, this thing about exponential you know both in population and growth and in scarcity of resources and you know, corruption of the environment is accelerating very fast mm -hmm. your generation is is aware of that but you need to even be more aware of it you have your pants are on fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of my landscapes are just because they're beautiful places. So like, this is a little, little thing called Clear Fork Creek over in the Nob Nostra State Park. So just a place where we go and paint it a lot of times on location, fish there, just a close place. So beautiful fall imagery that I wanted to paint. Yeah. I love the, the oranges and the yellows. In this one and the blues thank you so that it's always, it's always all about color and value and all those art oh, yeah. ideas that's that's what we make art about mostly if you want to stop and think about it and 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 what we love i mm -hmm. mean it's so much easier to make art about what's interesting to us rather than trying to maybe chase what we think the rest of the world is interested in you know, you'll never catch up with that. You got to just go ahead and be honest with yourself and deal with what you really are interested in. And it'll be more authentic, I do believe. Yeah. And although a lot of these pieces that John's talked about so far are, are 
pretty spectacular places like, uh, you know, the Buffalo Rivers are just amazing. And of course, Hawaii is amazing. But as he said, these are these are just you pull off the road anywhere in Missouri that a creek goes. Mm -hmm. Walk out your backyard and see the, the leaves changing. That that it's there are always things to paint. And they're and they're just as as valid as the, the earth shakers, you know, they're just as beautiful. Yeah, I agree. And this next one is oh, one like of my one favorite. Yeah, you'd like this one. I thought you did. It's a big <laughs> one too. Yeah, that's uh, that's at down in Cave Hollow. I used to teach plein air classes there, and we had a winter. I don't remember when was that painted. It say it doesn't say. Anyway, it was almost not a winter, so I had this idea to paint fall into into spring and just skip winter. So this beautiful curve of the creek made for that kind of a travel through kind of idea. So here we go into fall and now here's spring and we skip winter all together. It's like some people go, oh, that's great. And I right. don't like winter. <laughs> yeah, so that's just more of a, a beautiful place. But it's also sometimes I or for a long time and I still do. I'll grab subjects from those places like the uh, um, Jack in the Pulpit and I'll blow it up bigger and put it right over the top of, of the of the landscape, the scale mm -hmm. out of place doesn't necessarily have to be accurate for me in my conceptual studio works. Yeah. Usually on, on location, it's all about measuring and learning what that vocabulary of the place is. And it's generally speaking more accurate, but get into the studio and you start playing with ideas and design and loosen up as much as I can, which is limited. <laughs> I hope There's a scientist in me that's hard to get me to be <laughs> working on a piece and I'll and I'll go in and I'll go, oh, I'll just stand there, you know, I have my hand on my heart and I'll go, oh, Jesus, honey, that's gorgeous. Just step away. And he'll look up. I, I, this is the first layer. It's like, oh, no, please. Oh. <laughs> we, I'm excited just... to look at your work afterwards, because I know there's a lot of um, a little bit more abstract composition. So I'm, I'm it's, it's how we see that it's who we are as human beings. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting it's... to see both of your work together. We influence each other in in the 20 plus years that we've been painting together 30? she's 30 50 i don't know, I know. 60 how long we've been life. together forever Our life. anyway <laughs> we already told them we weren't together for a while yeah well, in anyway in back <laughs> she's brought a lot of color into my work mm. you know magnified my sensitivity or my willingness to get away from local color natural color which is exciting and i feel like maybe i've put more space in some of her work yeah yeah, yeah. so I it's, it's a complementary kind of support of each other although we're very similar artists in a lot of ways because we're very similar people well you know when we met one another he one of the first things he says is come 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 home with me and i want to show you my work and first thing i said one of what was very soon <laughs> and, and, and let you me know, show you my etchings yeah and i thought oh yeah right <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, but he, but he was. But he, she did. But he was so he was so tempting that I did, <laughs> and and that's exactly what he really did do. Is he started hauling out all these paintings, and and it was very exciting because number one, I recognized immediately who he was. It was like more than any conversation or any other kind of thing we could. I, it's like I I know you. I, I I know you. I see that, and I I know who you are. And the other one was that. I recognize the places he'd been painting. And Arizona has a lot of public lands. I mean, a lot of public lands. Here, here in Missouri, you know, you, you want to go to where there's a state park or maybe a park. But the chances of going to the same place in public lands that another person has, gets pretty small. And I knew where he was. I was painting on the other side of the rock. You know, it's like I, I knew where he was. We, I, it was amazing. I mean, we never encountered each other before because we were we were painting the same places in the middle of nowhere. It's yeah. pretty cool. Very cool. Small world. <laughs> Ooh, Death Valley. New Mexico. Yes. New Mexico. I love that piece. Wow. Nope, that was purchased by the woman here in town, real estate oh, agent. Oh, that's right, that's right. That's a place called Catwalk Canyon, which was mined turn of the century. 
and it's a slot canyon that you just literally cannot walk up. So they built a catwalk up the side of it to bring a big pipe from up above down to where they were not smelting. They were milling out the uh, minerals that they were mining out of this canyon. So when I first went there many years ago, you could still walk on this catwalk. And it was like, I'm not sure this is really safe because <laughs> you're about. 40, 50 feet up this on the side of this rock canyon wow. and it's just screwed into the wall and it's all rusted out. And it was just like exciting as, yeah, as heck, yeah. but finally it flooded again and it took it all oh, out, such and, a disappointment. but it was a, they um, still have it. It's still, still exists, it, but the, it's still beautiful, but the but federal, re federal anymore. government replacement is a lot more um, personal friendly so it's a lot less well, yeah, exciting it's a, it's a government I mean, program to specs now. right so yeah. and you can only go up about half as far as you used to be able to go so anyway it's one of those dramatic crazy places out west that are so violent because of gravity and water and loose rocks and not as not as old geology geology as we have here mm -hmm. yeah. it's another thing I, I hear us tell our stories about these places because uh when you paint on location, you're taking in a lot more than you think you are. I mean, you 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 may or may not end up with an interesting painting, or you may make another painting or not. But the truth is, is that you're assimilating. You know, I, I look at these paintings and I know what the canyon smelled like. You know, mm -hmm. I can I can hear the sound of the of the cliff swallows and the silence and, and smell the extremely dry air and then what the water smells like. That they they fill you up with so much reference and information. And I think um, that I remember, certainly for younger artists when, when I was an art professor, that was, they, they didn't know, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't have too much outside of their own stuff to paint about. And not that seeing a canyon isn't your own stuff, it is your own stuff, but it's different than your hair color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're gonna close that window. Yeah, we're in this, we're in this right dramatic back. sunbeam. It's about to strike across. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Like, it's, it's, it's I know. Up on it, you know. <laughs> I love <laughs> that. Oh, movie. And so my, I, my recommendation is, is, is go out and taste the world, all of it, yeah. emotionally, stories, places. So this is a. These works are. We're lucky. We're, we, we've got this lifetime library. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't want more. I always want more. I always want more. But that's, you know, that was made possible because both of us are interested in being out there. Not everybody wants to be out in the woods. We brought kids from college out here for plein air classes, and some of them from the cities were like, it's scary out here, Mr. Louder. I'm just, I'm afraid yeah, of these creatures. The oh, is there anything dangerous down here? It's, it's, <laughs> it's, not like, the, it's not the landscape it's just, has to be it. It could be yeah, any, it could be yeah. whatever you, you know, if, if you're interested in putting together motorcycles, go, go sit in a motorcycle shop and work. Right. Whatever that is for you. It's not a right or wrong. No. It's just a, what you're interested in again, fill back your, to that idea. Fill yourself up. Mm -hmm. fill yourself up. Yeah, that was that was told to me when I was in college because I was starting to paint plants and I was like, oh, I know what a leaf looks like. And my professor was like, have you ever been to a greenhouse? <laughs> I was like, no, I haven't. So we took a trip to the K-State greenhouses and I did some studies and was surrounded by plants and learned things and just really like absorbed everything. So well, everything is so complex when you really get involved in it. It's just so much more than what you imagined if you haven't been next to it or into it or with it or right. yeah. Um, the, I guess the, the downside that I just put down is if you don't go out and fill yourself up, you don't have much to say in a pretty short period of time. Right. But the good side, the good side is there's no end to it. The more you see, the more there is to see. And you know that now. You, you've been to that greenhouse and you paint those things. And every time you go outside, you go, oh my God, look at that leaf. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't have happened without you painting those things. Exactly. And it doesn't stop. I should give you the good news. It doesn't stop. The more you see it, the more there is to see. It doesn't get boring. It yeah. seems infinite.
Absolutely. Um, let's do a couple more and then for sake of time, we can, we can switch over. Well, I guess I want to talk about your, your satellite paintings again, but, um, we can finish this page. We're almost finished. This is just a little side Canyon over up from the Canyon. We just talked, talked about over in New Mexico. And it was just a beautiful spot with, we hiked up there one evening, the sun was going down and it's just one of those little magical places in a small creek with a trail up it and it just came out came out in my head and in in the studio in a way that it worked do we sell this thing is it with this no thing? it's still out it's oh, in good i want it i'd like <laughs> to bring it out and spend some time with it it's so beautiful it's in the shed long <laughs> <there right now. laughs> Well, it's not a shed exactly. We've yeah. kept our work in sheds for years, but we actually have a real place. There. <clears throat> yeah, dehumidifier and temperature yeah. control. Mm -hmm. So had to bite the bullet. Yep, that's important. All right. Um, so let's really quick switch over. Oh, um, this looks familiar. Yeah. So we were talking about your satellite paintings. Um, and so just a little bit of background about this project. So let me, yeah, yeah I'll, go I'll go, I'll get started. I looked it up last night. I was curious after you mentioned that we were gonna talk about 1% for the arts and the original 1% for the arts was actually during the, the New Deal, 1930s. It was a federal funded 1% for art production. It, it had to be anything with public money or buildings, I believe is how it usually works, had to be spent 1% of the, of the estimated budget had to be spent on art. Yep. Um, one of the first cities to start doing that was San Francisco. And, then, and that was, I think in the seventies, the first state to do 1% was Hawaii. There's now 20 states, I believe approximately that do 1% for the arts. Missouri is not one of those states, but there's a lot of cities that do 1% of the arts or some other sort of percentage support of public money being spent on architectural um, spaces also have to spend money on art. So Kansas City is one of those that has a 1% for the art and they've had it since 1986, I believe, or 84, anyway, in the mid, mid 80s. So they've been doing that for a long time. And of course, everybody should know by now that uh, Kansas City is building a new airport. Well, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. It's about, 6.5 million billion it's dollar their big their deal. Biggest, I think it's their yeah, it's biggest. the biggest public works project, I believe, in the history of Kansas City. So 1% of 6.5 billion is like 6.5 million, I think. <laughs> Something like that. That's a lot of art. So everybody got excited about the 1% for the arts and they hired, uh, I don't know who the individual is, but they hired somebody to administrate this proposal to get to ask for RFQs and choose the artists. And they did a very, very good job, I, I believe, in the process. They opened up some of the bigger ones, the bigger parts of the, of the RFQs or the artworks in the ticketing area, which is a great big space. So there's public artists that actually make livings making large, expensive public very art expensive, pieces expensive. for um, those kinds of spaces. Parking lots. And they opened that up at it at an international competitive level. Then there was a next call for art. I can't remember exactly how much the monies were there. That's sculpture. where that's where the bigger money was. Yeah, they're more like architectural art usually. And um, that, that one was filled up. And then they got really smart because they don't always do this, especially in, in international airports. Sometimes the airports will just buy high-end, big name art pieces and burn up the budget on those. But this administration and, and everybody that was in this decision-making process decided in the concourses, there were 20 spaces in the, or 19 spaces in the concourse that are four feet high and 20 feet long that have been designated by the architect for art. So they opened up that process to just regional artists, which I think is cool. So they sent out the RFQ that's request for qualifications and people applied and sent in their proposals. And I was lucky, one of those lucky people that actually got chosen. Um, I worked out this idea about the satellite landscapes. I talked about the fact that people are gonna be driving through the rural parts of Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska to come to the airport and see these, seeing these beautiful places. And then they're gonna get in this airplane and they're gonna fly over them 
So I worked right into what I'd already been painting. This good I this idea that I already had certainly made sense to me in relationship to this idea of being through the landscape and then over the landscape, either coming in or going out of the airport. So I'm going to include the sight lines, the little lines on the sides of it, and then the projection. And then I'm including a shadow of a passenger jet in each of the satellite images that points to where the the direction to the airport. I think they like that idea. Oh, so. cool. But you've got to know, of course, that these are not the paintings. These are the This is the proposal. The so yeah. I get to I get to make them similar to these. Right. It will be season. I will certainly make them seasonal. I don't know exactly which ones I'll choose. I, um, it'll be it'll be quite similar to this. Problem with Google Earth is it, it's not seasonal, so I have to make it up to fit the, the where there isn't a Google Earth winter of <laughs> of the area that I was looking at. So right, but you have engaged somebody to do. Oh well, yeah, I, I, some. I had uh, our gallery director come out and we played with one of his drones. He flew it higher than he was supposed to, and we took some images with it. And so, so we're looking into maybe make it. But I'm kind of okay with the fact that I can take that satellite image and then turn it into the same season just because I know how to do that from looking at them for so long and making the colors correct. So that's that's ongoing. I just got my, what's it the called? Provider number. I need the provider number. <laughs> you don't, working, you don't think through, about that as an artist. The, yeah, Kansas City Hall is a slow, creepy, mm -hmm. crawly thing. <laughs> you think about the piece and how you're going to execute it, but yeah, you don't think about first... how long it's going to take even get permission and licenses to yes. start. But he's about through. He's been persistent. We're not supposed to be completed with our work until next November, and so no big rush for me. I, I know I can get my pieces done in time. I don't know about everybody else. Some of them have some pretty serious projects. Yeah, they selected a really, really nice diverse, group. not only as artists, but from backgrounds group of artists. I was really excited about how they, they worked this out. It seems like a really yeah. good artist selection process for the airport. And they had curators that weren't from here at all, so they were they were really doing yeah. The, they could the art the selection committee was from all over the United States and not shouldn't have been any biases in that. Yeah, it's ex it's exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know a few other artists that are part of it, and I I'm very happy with the selections that they chose, and I'm excited. Yeah, we both are too. All right. Well, Annie, are you ready? <laughs> sure. Okay. Where do you want to start? Why don't we go with uh, the third one from the left? Because those are some of my more representational works. Is and if you click on that image, it'll take you there. I hope it doesn't give you too much to load through. Oh, go down. Sorry. We'll stay on this page. Okay. Oops, I do a lot of work. Let's go up, go up. Let's let's go up, and stop right there. Is that? Yes. All right. The one that was on the on the on the very first part of the website page. This is not it, and that was much more representational. Um, again, working plain air. When I'm there, I try. I don't, although I, this is changing for me, but traditionally, historically, I I don't try to make a lot of deliberate changes or abstraction. Although the truth is, is I see the world like this. This is when I go out to, I can do a landscape that is very representational. I can sort of squeeze myself down to that, but that is really not my personal experience of the land. I think I had to learn to do it the other way in order to believe in my own vision. But this is, even when I do a, a landscape, this is pretty traditional for me, the one that we're looking at right here. This is a series that I did uh, about three years ago. It's called Crow's Wood. And it is um, just from one of our local uh, reservoir camps down here in Missouri, not very far away that we love to go camp in. And I did a, a number of plein air pieces. This is not a plein air piece. This is a studio piece. Uh, I, I had gotten the information that I needed. I didn't work from photographs on this. I, I prefer not to, although I'll go into that. I'm doing it a little more now with models and people. Um, but I, I wanted more work perhaps from the work that I worked from and the experience that I had. Uh, photographs give me too much information. Mm -hmm. You know, I find myself 
you know, doing the scale and the colors that I see reproduced. And I, I really, in the photograph, when I'm there, that's not what my experience is. When I was at the Buffalo River, I did a whole lot of landscapes that were red and orange, and it was in the middle of spring. There was no red and orange at all, but it felt red. I don't know if the, the emotional experience of the place was red. And it wasn't until I got home and looked at the pictures that I'd taken and then the paintings that I did on location, and I realized that the colors that I was painting weren't at all what were there. It was, it was kind of, it was like a, a wow. I hadn't realized it was that dramatic. So I don't try to alter that anymore. I just let those, those be, you know, let them be that. Yeah. I think there's, a, if we, is anything coming up on that? If we click on that, does anything come up on that? Mm, no. no. Oh, let's see. Maybe I would just scroll down a little bit. Crowswood series. Nope, nope, nope. Sorry. Uh, it must be oh, slow. It comes I, up here. on the sidebar. There they are. There we go. There they are. Uh, so these are more of that series. Um, this um, Sherry Lady Contemporary Art represents me in Kansas City, and she has this one on reserve. Okay. Uh, she likes, so she's representing this piece. And if you just want to click on a few more, and this one as well. Sometimes they appear there. I will go to the same place. They're this, in many times they're ex almost exactly the same place, but the time of day or my experience. We were talking earlier about the more you see, the more there is to see. So I'll, I'll do one and then I'll go, oh, you know, there's more here. Mm -hmm. And so they will, they, they, I often work in series. Um, it's not planned. But I will, there's more that I want to do there. I, I, I want to spend more time there. I want to see what I can coax out of that, what I can allow myself to experience. And then they become a series. We can just look at the others kind of quick. Yeah, if you want. She's got this one too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. I love this one. <laughs> too. Thank you, Allison. I like that one too. Nice. So this is just off the edge of an ordinary campground. We have a little travel trailer, very small, that we um, we use to go and spend several days. It gives you a chance to get out of the out of the weather, you know, and uh, not have quite so much to clean up, so you can spend more time working on your work. I haven't gone back to this place um, for a year and a half. And my companion on all these pieces uh, was a beautiful dog and we mm -hmm. lost him and I haven't had the heart to go back since maybe one more year and I could be able to bear to go back to this place again yeah. without him. Yeah. So let's, look at, let's look at some others. Let's see what else we have in the series. We'll just go, go on through. Now, again, this is, I, I got to tell you that I'm, I, I wake up at different times and I'm a different person. Well, I'm the same person, but it doesn't always look like that. Recently, we had a, we've been renovating our home and we decided to take in our living space, we got rid of all the television screens and big furniture and we left a whole wide open space. It's about it's three feet long and we don't put anything on it except the work that we're working on at that time. Oh, cool. You know, it's, it's, it's when you sit in the evening, you, you could spend time, our home and studio are in the same place now. And you can spend time looking at your work. Yeah. And it has been more important to me, I've been telling students for years, put it in the bathroom if you need to, put it up. But this, being able to sit for long times and look at it under a good viewing condition, good lights, a lot of space around it. Because sometimes I think, well, what do all these pieces, what, what do they have to do with one another? What does, and I realized that it, when you put them all up, it becomes very clear, whether I'm working in textiles, which you know I love to do, or paintings, or representational, I put that in quotes, or abstract. Um, let's click down on some of the others just for fun in that series. These were out of my experience in Hawaii. Remember okay. that he, did, he did those, the, the big cliffs, and I came back and I did these pieces. And they're all a series. Yeah. So they have a very different palette than a Missouri palette, for example. Mm -hmm. 
We spend a lot of time on the cliffs. So going back to what these works all have in common, uh, irrespective of the series or the medium or what you want to call them, the subject matter, um, they're all informed by my experience of my love of land. That said, I'm interested in color and, and in texture and pattern and design. And that's, 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 that's pretty much it. You know, that's, that's what my fascination is. These relationships of color. Some of the artists that have influenced me the greatest, probably when I think about who I admire, it would be Pierre Kirkby. It would be, it would be Diebenkorn. Um, it would be Fairfield Porter. The, these incredible relationships of designers. Uh, those would be painters. Do you have any questions about these? Oh, um, do, so mo are most of these oil, are all of these oil? These are all oil. I call them, I realized when I was done what they were about, they're maps. Oh. They are maps of where we went. Okay. And what we saw and what we did. Okay. And they're also psychological maps. And that's why this is a map called the map series. Got it. What's it like, you know, to spend a month intensely looking at the ocean on a, from a cliff or from a beach? We, Hawaii is very popular and very popular. Mm -hmm. We found if we went out at dawn that we, for hours, would have the entire beach to ourselves. And um, this, this relationship between the sky and the cliffs and the horizon, you know, how to, how to paint about that. How, well, I, I can't tell you how, but this is what happened. This yeah. is, <clears throat> and now these are done with no photo references or um, paintings. Although I did a lot of paintings, they were very representational. This yeah. is accumulated experience. And these came quick. They're often completed in one day, just fast, fast, put it out fast. Yeah, like stream of consciousness. Yeah, stream of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. So you're so you're sort of so you're not hungry to do it anymore, right? And it's, it's done. It's done. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, I it would, I would have a really hard time going back and trying to do any more in this series because that's not where I am anymore, and right. now it's a memory. There are books over there, or sketchbooks from. Yes, they are. Go ahead, keep talking. They're, they're just a memory. Yeah, it, it, and it's too far away. But right. I, I do think they, if you think about the ones that we just saw that I did a year and a half ago of Crowswood, they're, they're, they are related. Sometimes yeah. I look back on those and go, God, I wish I could do that. But I know I can't. There's no point in trying to go back. It's just right. Yeah. Right. Once it's done, you've got it out there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at a few more and see what else we have. Just a second. Let me, let me break into this. Okay. Real oh, this would be fun. Hey. This is my journal from that time and I don't know yeah, yeah. look at yeah. so, so these are so these are every day going wow. these are gouache I started working gouache on paper when we used to take things um, <clears throat> oils and pastels and all sorts of stuff but when you're on an airplane you gotta you gotta you gotta cut it down you gotta really yeah. you gotta really narrow it down we, we have shelves and shelves of these things so what we do when we come back from our sketches, we look at them, but usually they just go into these books. Yeah, yeah, nobody ever sees them again. And then, then we work from them either by they, memory. They're just or, diaries. They get put on the shelf. We have. But we now have you can see lots of them. So how those maps have been. These <clears throat> maps that were quite representational, this one in particular, are now something else. But I couldn't do the something else without having but done this, these. You know, these two seem more like the maps already. Yeah, I'm starting to move into it on this. I'm starting mm -hmm. to see it as that. What is the essence of this place? But I have to, I have to take it down. It's like taking notes from a master. You know, when you take notes from Mother Nature, you want to really listen and go as close as you can to what she's giving you before you can get a little bit deeper 
So there's a there's a month of learning <clears throat> visual vocabulary and swallowing it up. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's a lot, honey. I went fast. <laughs> yeah, that might give you an idea how that how that ingestion is essential. And when I'm doing this ingestion, I have no idea where it's going to go. I don't know if I'm even going to go anywhere with it. But usually after an experience that intense, hundreds of hours of looking and painting, um, then, you know, it's like you, you, stuff happens. And I didn't know these were going to be maps until I was quite a ways into the, in, excuse me, into the body of work. And then I realized that's what they were. We had a rental car. We went here and there and here and there and here and there. And then a lot, of, you know, it's like, you know, exploring an entirely new environment. I have spent a lot of time on water uh, as a young person when I was traveling with my mother all through Northern Canada and Alaska, big rivers, but not on the ocean. I mean, I've been to the ocean, but not that, not, not enough to feel that I it was something that was already within me. But after a month here, I, I, there was more in me, although it still was very connected to the land. I'm not out in the middle of nowhere in any of these. Okay, let's see what else we got. Ah, this is a good one to talk about. Uh, I told you that I came from a family of writers. And my when I, a few years ago, I met with my cousins and we had sort of a family reunion at the occasion of my beloved aunt's a memorial. And we started talking to one another and I realized I'd been away from them a long time that different than most people that I participate with that we are my, my tribe, my family, we, we exchange stories. Usually on top of one another, we don't wait for the other one to finish. But it is, this layering of stories. Uh, and for me, the stories are in visual form. Uh, now, it's funny, all through graduate school, I actually got in a fight with some of my professors. They wanted me to include in the human form in my work. And I, di I didn't want to because I was really, I was really at that time grieving about the planet when it really hit me where it really is. And I, I didn't want to make any more stuff about us. It wasn't all about us. You know, it wasn't all about us. There's a hell of a lot out here that isn't about us. Yeah. It's a species. So I uh, really avoided the human form. But it's, I, I, it's hard to tell a story. from a, If you're a human being, it's, it's really hard to tell a story without starting to put some sort of reference to your species in there. I started by putting things like a, a table or a chair or even the shadow that would indicate that there was somebody else in, in the story besides a tree or, or a cow. And so they started to come into my work. Now, this is a fairly big oil. It's one of the first ones I started to do. It's called Sleeping with Cows. And it, um, I also did a large textile of this piece. It is uh, about what, it's, what it was like to move to Missouri <laughs> and to, have a, we're surrounded by we're surrounded by uh, we're lucky to be surrounded by uh, pastures and fields and forests, and we walk uh, a lot, and we hear we get to actually know in many ways the animals that live around us, including the herds of animals. And um, in the summer, if you leave the window open, you can hear them speaking to one another. You know, you can tell what's going on with the cattle. If, if they've been separated or moved in their herds, they can be very hard to listen to. They, they have a lot of distress. They cry for days after they're moved from their pastures or their or their their friends. But a lot of times it's just, you know, they're just kind of speaking, are you over there? Oh, you are over here. So it's like this wonderful, wonderful body, spiritual sense. There's when I see a cow lying down, there's nothing. That speaks more to me about the connection between mammals and this planet. This they have such an accord. So anyway, this is what this piece is about. Um, it's, that I could imagine what it would be like with them. Yeah, this is a different fellow. This is different. And if you want to scroll down a little bit, I 
think we cut the head off. Go the other direction. Oh. There we go. There we go. This is my bear series, and it's spelled B-A-R-E. I am, uh, as I mentioned, my family is from Alaska, and I lived on the North Slope, way up, way up uh, near Bear. Well, my father's home was uh, about 175 miles by air from the nearest neighbor. So I really have had a lot of contact with bears in my life. I love bears. They come into my work a lot. And uh, I also, um, so I'm playing with metaphors here. I'm trying to talk about something that's extremely painful for me, um, the degradation of the planet and the loss of habitat. Mm. And so um, I'm doing it in the way I can. Uh, it's funny, I think sometimes if we, we can talk about really horrific things in a beautiful way and they're more palatable, especially I found that out in textiles. You can talk about really horrible things and if it's beautifully done, people will stop right. and look at them. They're hard to do. They're hard to do. They take an emotional toll. You know, I can't do them very often. I, it just breaks my heart. But this is one of that series and this one is called Casting Off or Unraveled. This one's called Unraveled. Yeah. And we can just go through a few more real quick, see what else I got in there. And this is a, again part of the bear series. And this one is also the bear, one part of the bear series. I did a textile on this one too. Sometimes I make textiles for my paintings. Uh, I don't plan on doing that. It's just when I'm done with the pen, I'm glad I got to put that one in cloth. Yeah, I'm excited to look at your textiles. We'll do that in a little in a minute. And then just some silly things. I go to Chicago to visit family, and you know, so this so this is kind of this file has a whole lot of stuff in it that is not necessarily a related piece. Go down to the, some of the ones on the bottom that are charcoal. I'd like to show those. I love to work in charcoal. These are about 40 by 32, and they're from direct observation. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Is that a, a painting or is that a mirror? It's a mirror, it's a okay. mirror. This is oh. called Show Me the Way to Go Home. Ah, uh, I should have looked at the title. <laughs> oh, wow. Did you do a painting of this one or a textile? Similar, you did some paintings with the chair. I did something with a red chair. Hospitals here in town, and I can't remember <clears throat> that has um, a number. Some of this imagery. Yes, I do draw from my own imagery. Usually, it sometimes it is actually the real piece. Like mm. in the case of the textiles, I almost use it as a pattern, and sometimes I'm just drawing from them. We have this is our backyard, one of our backyard areas, and. We have these wonderful chairs that are that are old chairs. They really are antiques. They're older than John, and uh, they're just I can't resist them. They're just they're like jelly beans. I yeah. go to the one that is. Um, if we look, go up, 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 up there. Uh -huh. So this would be more of the same thing, and this is called living room, and it's um, a recurring uh, theme for me over and over again about that. This planet is where we live. It's not something outside that is separate from us. For me, it is. It is. It is part of who we are, and and we are privileged to be here. And then just stuff done, plain air, fun, starting to move things around in space. Just silly things. Nothing big. No big deal. Just fun to make. Yeah. We won't spend too much time on this one, but this talks really briefly. Anybody want to take go to the site and take a look at that? Uh, working in plain air in Colorado. We used to go quite a lot. We didn't because of the pandemic. And now we probably won't for a while because of the forest fires. I hope we do still go back because I love to go to the high country. Yeah. There were moose down in that area. It was the most amazing thing. Just wow. Awesome. So that's, that's how we work and working with gouache. Okay. And all of these pieces are either gouache or pastel on paper. Oh yeah, I have one of these. I think I have. No, 
Hmm. Man, I have them all up. That's Alaska. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I have one of them. You do? I didn't know that. I'm just scared. Yep, I bought one from the Strucker Nelson West Gallery. Awesome. Anyway, not important. Let's keep talking about your work. No, I'm, I didn't know that, and I'm very pleased that you do. I'm confident. Yeah, I love it. So if we scroll down a little bit more, do we come to anything? Or are we done with that one? I think uh, these are, again, uh, gouache on paper. Oh, it's these are some of the thousands of them. Yeah, probably you did from this group. This is the Colorado group. That's the one that I own. That's just awesome. <laughs> Um, gouache on paper is really fun to do, although these aren't on paper. These are on those gessoed, pre-gessoed cradled panels. Yeah. And I started to move to that because I, I, I was getting too many books on my shelves. And I thought it would just be fun to work on those panels instead, because otherwise nobody ever sees them. You know, right. they just disappear into my book. And so these are on those little panels we bought, several cases of them, and just put them through them in the back of the pickup, you know, and you just go out three or four in your backpack every day, and then you go, you do do something, you know, just grab yeah. them. And they're gorgeous hung mm -hmm. together, yeah. like as a bunch of them together on the wall. We did um, a show um, at UCM when we came back one, one year, the annual faculty show, we did a wall. Oh, cool. It was a moose there that kept us and a calf between us and our camp. And oh, we couldn't God. figure out we're just to the right. You know, if you were standing to the right, there she was. I'm looking, I'm painting this thing. And I go, my God, there's a moose. <laughs> uh, if anybody's ever been with moose, they are very protective of your, they're young and they're huge. They are so big. So finally, there was a road just to the right. And we waited till somebody was coming down into the campground and we jumped out and we kept the car between <laughs> us. And the moose, we just said, do you mind if we go with you? We're running along the way. And the moose did come after us, but we were able to get into the camper in time. We were fine. Yeah, we were fine. Wow. But it was a bit of a moment there. That's great. It was a privilege. It was a privilege. Yeah, they're pretty majestic creatures. <laughs> That's uh, some of the sand dunes where John did his work. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're just amazing animals. I still have a lot of these little pieces. I'd love to have somebody collect some of them. Yeah. So this is a gouache on paper. Yes. So we started, I started walk, working a lot in gouache. It was like watercolor, but more forgiving. And I, it's funny, I, I worked, I taught watercolor forever. Um, I worked, I loved it forever. But at this time in my life, I'm not so weak. It's, it's not very forgiving, which wasn't a problem for me. It's kind of like a Zen thing or, or like a dance, you know, you got to get your balance and then you jump and you got to stick with it. But I, um, I really like to start to put things down and then let them become as I paint. And so that, I, I, this allows me, I don't want to say corrections. It, it's not about corrections. It's about major adjustments. I can move things around with gouache because and also use it transparently so if i want to you know if i want to make a tree a different color or take it out all together or make it bigger or whatever i want you know distort that space that that the gouache gives you that immediate immediate see and it's not the not the original gouache it's the acrylic gouache yes, yes, that the dries and you can layer over the top of yeah it. it's yeah. not it's not the stuff that it's not designer's gouache it's the more contemporary Acrylic gouache. Designer gouache, you, when it uh, when it gets wet, it, it, it all comes back up to the surface and gets kind of mushy. And mm -hmm. I wanted really hard surfaces to work back into for both the creating of the work, but also the, the transportation of the work. Oh, there's one of my chairs. Oh, right yeah. There. Yeah. So I got a whole bunch of them on my front yard. Go out every, go out, you know, and just sit down for, a, you got half an hour in the evening, and you just, you just do these. Yeah. There's another one. These are, these are on paper. Oh, here's a picture of the chair. There, there they are, those chairs. Those aren't the fun ones, though. Yeah, these are the Adirondacks. Right, those this are the classic Lewis chairs. You'd like that one. I love this one. <laughs> yeah, that, would be, that would be your kind of painting. I love it. Um, I'm going to just look closely. So, okay, we saw some of those. So, let's go down one more time. Because yeah. I wanted to talk about the textiles oh. and also uh, some narrative work that I'm doing now. And yeah, okay. let's talk about the textiles. Okay. Uh, I started doing the narratives and textiles much, quite a bit 
before I did very many things in painting that were narratives. And these are large pieces. Um, this is a moderate piece, 60 by 60. They get to be bigger than that. And uh, they are um, very personal stories, some of them. This one is called Waiting in a State of Grace. And the woman is pregnant and she's blue. So this one has a, a lot of personal meaning. Um, there, when people ask, how do you make them? Um, sometimes I dye my own cloth and all that other stuff. I know all how to do discharge and whatnot, but sometimes I just get down to the basics really simple and use commercial cloth. I do a lot of overlays. And I don't think we can see on this one. There's all kinds of silk overlays and hidden figures in there. You see it in person, but I'm not sure that you can see it on this. Yeah. I'm borrowing from signifiers, you might call them from art history, you know, the, the Madonna and the angels and the pomegranates represent um, fertility. Mm -hmm. so bring it down so we can see the top a little bit more. I think we'll go the other way. There is a hidden figure, there she is, yeah. So there's a lot of hidden figures in there. And I'm also starting to really take some liberties with the spatial relationships here. And again, this isn't um, a photograph, obviously. And I, I'm, I'm starting to segment it. I, I, I started doing this quite early. I, I love this horizontal vertical. I love the structure underneath organic forms. Um, they really set one another off. And also they, they give me little windows to move beyond representational space. Yeah. Uh, they're complex. They take a lot of time. They're all, they're, a lot of them are machine made, but they're hand stitched. So uh, in other words, they're big and they're heavy. And yeah. uh, they're so big that the table that I sew off of is, you don't sit at it, you stand at it like the workbench. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, just sort of drive and maneuver these things. And sometimes they have to go together in pieces that you then put together. It's a little bit hard sometimes because a lot of the times you're working flat because the pieces are all loose to see what you're doing. Uh, I've been known to work for two or three days and then finally get up, put it up on the wall and discover it's not what I want at all. So I I don't rip it out. I'll just cover it up. I'll just start just like you would with paint, you know, you don't like that, that face, that tree, that figure, that vase, you just scrape it down and cover it up. Well, it can't scrape it down in this case, but I just flap another piece of cloth on it to redesign. So technically they're, 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 they're muscular. They take a lot of work, but when I'm done with them, I uh, always do extensive hand embroidery and hand quilting because I think uh, it's my respect for textiles and that they are made by hand and that cloth elicits emotions that paint doesn't. It yeah. speaks to us of body and of domesticity and, and of women's time. And I have no desire to deny that. Some of the first ones I made were all hand stitched, but they took a year and a half, you know? So you realize that, you know, I got a hundred of these in my head and I'm not gonna live to be a hundred. I hope I, I hundreds pretty hard. Uh, so you have to find ways to move forward a little faster. Yeah. You, you want to honor that they're precious, but you don't want to get fixated on it. Does that make sense? You want to take risks with it? Yep. Let's Thank look you. at some down on the bottom down there because they're fun. I love the cats. Ah, more cows. Now I've wor worked for a long, yes, there they are again. I worked for a long time in only a gave myself kind of obstacles. I only worked with silk and I only worked with hand dyed silk. And I did that for about three years. Wow. And then I thought, oh, well, Jesus, you know, why, why, who, 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 who made this up? I'm glad I did that. But I thought, okay, so let's get the loudest, brightest, almost obnoxious pattern cloth that you can buy. Let's just, let's just, you know, forget buying cloth that looks like little trees or grass. Let's just get these enormous graphic designs. Found a lot of that in Hawaii. That was good. Yeah, I did. Oh, really? And, and then, <laughs> yeah, I love the internet. It allows me to find big designs. And I also happen to love birds a lot. You'll see that they're in my work a lot, mm -hmm. not in the material than in the subject matter. Um, and see if I can make these as flat and as patterned and complex as possible. You know, this one is called Cows, Cats, and Cupcakes. Yeah. Yes. 
I would love to, I have three of these that are a series. I'd love them for them to go to a children's hospital, Ooh. but I haven't found a collector yet willing to do that. But for anybody right. out there, I want yeah. these to go to a children's hospital. We'll manifest because, that. Because they're very playful. And you know something, children get it. Most adults look at this and they go, oh my God, I can't see what's going on there. They don't see it at all. It's this kaleidoscope of confusion. But children, every single time they'll go, oh, look at the cat. Yep. You know, they get it just right away. This is, yeah. they, this is they haven't, they, they don't have all the constraints on how it ought to look yet. So they're, they're perfectly willing to go for a calico cat. Right. You know, they don't feel the need to make sense of it either. They don't feel the need to make sense of that. And in doing so, they are, they explore. I love to show these to kids. That's that's why I think they should go to Absolutely. a hospital or facility for children. They're very playful. Yeah, I yeah. love them. I think I've seen them in person at the, the gallery. Um, and they're yeah, large. I can't remember. Um, oh, you've I seen these. These are cats too, a little bit different. Yeah. This, this one's called Fishy Business. <laughs> I love it. Fish. It's, Where not too big. Is... it's 42 by 42. The cat is, oh, I can't point. I don't have a pointer. She's oh. on the lower right hand quadrant. That's it. That's the right back. Here? Girl around the back. Ah. The and go on all the way around as a red cat hiding out in there. And there are ah. fish too. She's got it. He, actually, it's he. That's Carl. I used. I have done Carl so many times. No, because Carl <laughs> was the most amazing Buddha cat. Everything about him was round. <laughs> Let's flip through, flip through a few more. I think. Oh, this one. That's a great one. This is called. You're gonna have to scroll them down a little bit to see the top. This is called Travels with the Saint. And I actually have this one in my home. I haven't been able to part with it yet. It's made as a memory of I have this amazing best friend, Yolanda de Soto. She lives in Tucson, Arizona, and I have had so many adventures with her. She is so willing to go on any adventure. Uh, I love her so much. Uh, she's not the saint. Uh, the saint is on the, her shoulder. It's a cat. And you can't see it in this, but that sort of white stuff around the top of the cat, are all. it's all kinds. I'm using out outrageous material i'm using um sequined uh things for ball gowns and all sorts of stuff in here i'm just knocking it out cool this one i love ah there's this more highlight here's more things about cupcakes yeah, okay, I, like uh, which is interesting i love cupcakes but i haven't <sighs> eaten sugar in about eight years i took wow. it off, yeah i took it off my off my diet and i, I have rheumatoid arthritis and it's made mm. a huge difference that's what I've heard. Yeah, well, I didn't expect it. I wasn't even looking for it. It was a side effect, but I'm really glad that I discovered that. Yeah. Um, so these are geishas and, and cupcakes. And there is bling. Oh, my God. There's beading and there's sequins and there's tassels. And yep. there's, you know, the, the tassels are a foot long. I and love the tassels. <laughs> our, I wrapped this thing up the other day trying to figure out how to wrap it up. It was, uh, yeah, it was so, yep. So this is geishas and cupcakes. Um, what else we got? Yeah, that's a fun one too. I was a weaver for many, many years. I did large textiles. I don't think I have any of them on this site. Wow. So, but this is bringing in that. And this is all, I don't have any details on these, but these are all slashed and stitched and they're deep. This is yeah. like two inches thick. I see that. And this is um, in my experience of New Mexico, those canyons and those mountains that we went into. The, mount, the canyons would be back in those mountains. You go across these big open areas and then you go into these slot canyons. So this would be as you come down out the canyon into one of those beautiful alluvial fans with the incredible blaze of golden light and then all the textures of the desert plants, all the grasses. I yeah. really like this one too. That's beautiful. I'd love to see that one in person. Do you still have it or did you sell I it? I do before? have it. I do have it. Cool. I, uh, we, recently, we recently moved them out of one room and then inventoried them all. So I had a chance to see what I still have and don't have. I nice. like to live with this one for a while too, but I don't have a wall big enough for it without using our display wall. And that's a working space. Yeah. It is 60 inches tall. Yeah. It's a wow. delicious, lush piece. Love see the color. down at the very bottom? They're a little bit different. See those three blue? Yeah, yep. Those. That's oh, a series. Yeah. 
that now these are all called sleeping on the edge of the world and you can just kind of go through and they're about my Hawaii experience again but they're a little more um, deep they're mm -hmm. not as playful yeah they're a, little, they're a little spookier so equally as beautiful thank you gorgeous um what else do i have in there should we talk yeah. about the sculptures yeah let's do that because i have seen those in person too and i didn't even know you were doing them and then one day i went to the gallery the snw gallery just for fun because my parents live in manhattan and i visit often and i saw them and was like who is that and amy was like that's annie and i was like what <laughs> <laughs> well, I love sculpture and I wanted to do it all my life. Um, when I was an undergraduate, instead of studying painting, I wanted to study sculpture, but that's when I, my hands were really bad with my arthritis and I realized that that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So I started with watercolor because I could hold a brush and then painting and things go on, but I, they've always been there in my mind. And then the reason why not to do them, how to handle the tools and, and uh, I, I had this breakthrough when I realized that I could work with small tools, you know, that you can actually get saws that fit a woman's hand now. You didn't used to be able to, but you can get drills. And so I got, I got my own tool thing, which was really empowering. Um, and I'm also working a lot of these with text, textiles, mm -hmm. these birds and boats, this sad, sad series. Yeah. Wow. The beading is beautiful. And you, is that crochet? I don't know. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> and and um, I think this is hemp. Okay. Or jute, maybe. Hard on the hands. Mm -hmm. And stiffened with starch? Yeah, you, stiffened or? with, yes, yeah, special stuff. Okay. And this is called a Requiem series. The Requiem is a mass for the dead. And this one has, a, 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 again, to do with my, my, my deep sadness about this planet and how mm -hmm. we have what we have done to it. Yeah. It's regarded the sacredness of it. Again, when I do these, I, I, uh, they're hard. They're, they're hard. So then I got to do something like geishas and cupcakes. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, okay, so there's all, those are all the birds. Okay. Yeah. The ones that were all in on the wall together. Yes. And in the, wow. in, in the canoes, but if we go down, there's another series on sculpture. Yes. These are the ones I saw. These are my novella series. I grew up, uh, uh, when I, when I had a home, when I came home, we, my grandmother's home was in Tucson, Arizona. And so I spent my, my, um, my childhood, uh, deeply, embedded in um, the Catholic and also Hispanic culture. And that's where I grew up. And that's where my friends are and my background. And I didn't want to deal with that for a while because I really have a lot of respect for not stealing from another's culture. And obviously I'm not Hispanic, but nevertheless, there it is under the surface. You're not Hispanic? No. no. We have a grandson that is, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, uh, when I was a kid, we used to go down to Mexico a lot. We used to walk across the border. did it on a weekly basis with my buddies, my, my, my playmates, children. In those days, we wandered around, did whatever the hell we wanted. We were free like feral animals. And there was all these wonderful um, uh, altars. Mm. Um, where, where you go stop along the roadside and light a candle. And uh, they would be niches in the sides of, of, of rocks and walls and cliffs. They were everywhere. And uh, uh, they all tell little stories. So they started, this is the novella series, and they started with that idea. Uh, but they have grown into something else as well, although I'm still calling them novella series. Some of the, this is a big, tall thing. Um, I recently brought it home from, from uh, Manhattan. And I found a place to display it in the house. I usually make these and I have no place to put them except in our off to a gallery in our storage, but we found a place. And they all have to do, they're all based on these little houses with yeah. things that are inside the houses. And let's see, there's one, there's a blue one right there, up, up there. So inside all the houses, there's these things. 
these little altars. And um, they come from, they're all embroidered, with a lot of beadwork, all kinds of, and again, um, stuff. And they're not very big, they're um, like that. Um, you know, when I don't, there's a word for it. I know that when you, when you look at things, uh, water stains on the roof, you see faces and whatever it is you see. I, I've been like that all my life that everywhere I look, I see things and they're often much more interesting than what's I'm in my imagination. You know, you, <laughs> you know, you lie in bed and you go, oh my God, there's an alligator on the roof. Well, I, I finally started to trust myself and to get out my pencil and just sit down and draw it. I'd see it there and I go, oh God, there it is. And so this is where these came from. Yeah. Well, they didn't all come that way. The figure came that way. And then I realized that it required uh, something else. And this one is called Dark Moon Rising. Mm -hmm. and it's got creepy heads and all sorts of things going on with it. I just recently stripped this thing down and took it apart because it's too awkward to store and move and too fragile, all those shaky things. Yeah. So those trees are all gone. I'm about to put it on a new pedestal because I, I just th thought it needed it. Yeah. Um, question really quick. Do you ever do textile workshops or classes or anything like that? Or at this you point, no, you know, when I was, I was a professor, as you know, for 20 some years, uh, teaching art. And, uh, we've, that's been, we retired, retired from teaching, um, at, at just at the beginning of COVID. It was coincidental. Yeah. I was glad that it did happen. <laughs> Uh, but I'm really, I'm really interested. It's not that I wouldn't, but I, it'd have to be, it, it wouldn't be the first thing I'd want to do with my time. Yeah, that's fair. You know, you know, when you, all my life, I have waited to be able to just be a full-time artist because there's a lot of things I want to say that take time, you know, yeah. they take time. Click on, just, just click on those as we talk. Okay. So they, so they, they take time. Um, and I'm running out of time. I'm 70. I want every bit of it for my own development and work. Right. I've had two careers and I raised four kids and I had it, you know, taught hundreds of students, which was wonderful. But I'm getting really selfish with my time. So the answer to that at this point probably is no, because I yeah. just want to get up every day and bicycle and walk in my woods and make art. Enjoy my ask us husband. again in two years. Yes, Who knows? Ask us in two years. Right now, <laughs> right now you're scratched content. Off. It's just scratched off right now yeah, with the pencil. Yeah. yeah, that is totally fair. Um, sounds like a good routine to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I've waited my whole life to figure it out. I'm yeah, I'm... very cool. It's called swept. Oh, by the way, these are not ceramic, um, they are paper clay. Ah. Um, I, I look for ways, when I have an idea, I look for ways to access it as, as immediate as possible because if there's too many obstacles, you don't make it. Yeah, I don't have a kiln. I'm not an expert on chemistry, you know, to, and I know that, that ceramics is a lot of chemistry. I, I just want to make things. So I'm finding materials with, that allow me to do this and I'm, I'm figuring it out as I go. Um, this, these are made of paper clay. Um, textiles, uh, wire uh, armatures and wood armatures. Uh, parts and pieces parts from and junk pieces stores. From junk stores. Yeah. Uh, the, the little houses I bought from a, a craft shop, I bought about 10 of them so I could just really fool around them. Start with that as a base to start with. I found that really interesting. Go find something that looks interesting and then use it as the material to begin from to come up with an idea. This is another bear in this piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And the Madonna suite. Um, Those are thorns. I think you, I oh, mean, I yeah. Is it been a half an hour yet? <laughs> uh, half an hour times three. <laughs> I can talk to you I'm guys about one more body of work, the one I'm busy on now. Yeah. You go to the front page. On the very far right, that one right there. I hope it takes us more directly. No, yeah, there it is, right there. Aha. This is a new series that I'm working on now. And um, 
as I said, we have a lot of art to store. So I started working, I wanted to make my work less precious. These are oil on paper and I'm buying them by, on a big roll. And that means that when I'm done, I'm, I make them exactly the size, the maximum size will fit in my flat file. Mm -hmm. So when I'm done with them, I don't have to put the investment of framing and canvases and, and space. I just uh, put them in, in a flat file. I keep about three of them rotating on the wall at all the time. This is called the Shadow Sight series. And they have, Shadow Sight comes from a term that is um, when they discovered Google Earth, they realized, as you know, that there was all kinds of archaeological sites that were discovered that had never been noticed before because nobody could get far enough back to see the pattern. Right. And especially when the light of the, uh, of the sun hits it at an angle, they cast shadows and they are detectable. Things that were, are not detectable when you're standing right on top of them. Well, I'm using that as a metaphor for memory and for story. You know, things that happened in places, there was another bear. And so that's what this series is about. i am got one on the wall right now I was working on today. Um, they've kind of morphed into another series, although they're very closely related, called Dressing for the Journey. And if we go down to some of the bottom ones, you'll see that it would work. So the last few have kind of been on that menu. I don't know. That one needs, needs to be fixed. Yeah, it needs to be fixed. I think that last one works. There we go. Okay. That one was just completed about three weeks ago. Okay. And uh, there again, they're, they're playful and fun. Mm -hmm. This is my friend Yolanda again. She comes up a lot in my work because she's yeah. such a treasure to know. Don't get to see her very often. Wished I could. Get and uh, that's, uh, that's us in our travel trailer. Oh. The experience we had one night um, with this incredible fox screaming in the light in the night. This amazing serenade we had. We were all tucked up in our little campers. And it's just this wonderful gal out there singing to the moon. Love it. So awesome. some of them, uh, some of them, I know what they are, and some of them, I'm I'm not exactly sure what they're about. These characters just come from me. They just yeah. there they are. Okay. This one, this one just came into my work. And I think she's uh, my Aunt Lily that I never met, just heard stories about. Scroll down and see her head. I don't know how much you can see. Sorry. <laughs> Lily had a rotten life and was treated really nasty by her brothers and her father, very patriarchal family. Mm -hmm. I think so. When, I've, when she came into this piece, I decided she needed uh, something special. So this is Lily's surprise. She's no longer alive. This one's called Clean Sheets. This one's called Wild Horse. It's about my daughter and her son. Faith, Faith? That, yes. That's yeah. Yes, she is a wild horse and her son is a wild horse. <laughs> they are both wild, 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 wild. I love it. Very cool. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about, because I have all these questions, but you guys have just been answering them before I can even ask them. So, <laughs> um, I was looking on your, your bio and it said that you wrote a book called Tree Talk Forest Code. Oh, it's not a book. Oh. Tree Talk Forest Code is a huge body of textiles. Oh, okay. We, we, we probably find that in the textiles if you wanted to take the time to look at it. But I'll tell you about it. They're they're much more abstract, and they are. I, I believe that all of life is sentient. Um, that includes the bugs and the trees and everything, and they all talk to one another. But how do you do that without it being syrupy? How do you do that with sincerity? And so it's just not another new age thing. So I did a body work of 12 quilts. They're 50 inches wide and six inches tall approximately. And they're meant to be seen together as a body of work because they're like words in a sentence. And hopefully as they all go together, they make a meaning. Um, 
I'm sure I have it on the textile page for those of who are interested in looking at it. And I write about these series also uh, with those with those series when they're important. It is uh, I, I try to use other things than I try to use rhythm and pattern and design and texture to talk about their communication with one another, these natural places. Okay. And uh, it was, I did it pretty fast. I did the body of work in about a year's time and it was a huge amount of work. Wow. I, I thought I would never be able to turn my head again. I spent so much time <laughs> leaning over my table. I tell you, I really thought maybe I'd, I'd done it. Yep. But I, I can move my neck again, I'm delighted to tell you. <laughs> but that's what that one is about. It's called Tree Type Force Code. And there is a catalog. I don't know if I've made it available for sale. Okay. So that's what the under your publications that is the catalog of the text. Yes. Got it. Yes. No, I've never written a book. I that 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 uh, world was pretty much used up in my family. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. Your mom yeah. and your sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I, I probably I, I did I never went that way. I'm more visual. I mean, you're a storyteller in your own way. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I have loved talking to you guys. Um, and for your sake and for time's sake, I think unless there's anything else you want to mention, I feel like we've covered a lot, but we could go on forever. We're old. <laughs> Listen forever. We'll have to, we'll have to do another side conversation and just talk. Yeah. Some more. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're talked out. I think. Yeah. Oh God. Yes. That's fair. <laughs> All right. We won't talk to each other the rest of the night. No, so. <laughs> Just take a break. <laughs> well, thank you guys again so much for taking Awesome. We're honored that you thought of you. Yes, thank of you. Us. I have been following your career. I'm really excited to see you starting it so soon in your life. Uh, thank you. And I'm really excited to see where it's going to go. Thank you. You both are have been a huge inspiration since. Oh, thank you so very, very much. Years ago. So thank you thank so you much. Guys. All right. Well, I hope you have a good rest of your evening and good holidays. And thank you guys again. We the will. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye, guys. All right.